as I was preparing this talk, and this is I was telling Chris, it's the first time I've ever done this this particular topic. I've I do talks on all different naval topics, but I've never really done one on blockade running. And I've, I've found some interesting things. And even a couple of days ago, as I was kind of wrapping this up, Jim McKee at Brunswick Town had sent me some, some interesting things that I'm going to share with you here in a little while um, that's related to blockade running. But when I started putting this together, um, I'm kind of coming at this maybe from a different angle than, than a lot of people would. A lot of people, when they think about blockade running, are going to talk about uh, the financial aspects of blockade running and uh, a lot of the more sensational stories uh, re that revolve around the blockade running trade, the Rose O'Neill Greenhouse story and some of those. I kind of come at it more from a military standpoint, um, which is why I've titled this talk The Blockade and Blockade Running, because I think you, you have to talk about the blockade too to really bring it all into context. Um, so. President Lincoln, of course, declared the blockade of the southern coast on April 19, 1861. And from that point forward, naval strategy for both the Union and the Confederacy would at least be partially defined by the blockade. Um, and I think that's something we don't think about a lot when we think about the blockade and blockade running is naval strategy on both sides really feeds into uh, the, whole, the whole issue of blockading. And we're going to start with Union naval strategy. And this, this comes straight from Gideon Wells' 1861 annual report. And the first thing on there is close all insurgent ports along the coast under the exacting regulations of an international blockade. Now, that was a huge problem for the Union Navy in 1861. They did not have the ships to make that happen. And that was very, very evident to anybody uh, in the Union or the Confederacy at that point. Um, and you see some of the other things that end up in Wells' report, particularly combined naval and military operations, as well as pursuit of piratical cruisers, uh, because certainly they did uh, really want to stop people like Raphael Sims in the Alabama and things of that nature. But it's, it's really impossible to study the Civil War in North Carolina without having an understanding of the blockade and blockade running and how both affected the strategy. The occupation in northeastern North Carolina in 1862 was at least partially designed to assist the blockade. Um, having the, the coaling station at Beaufort was very, very crucial to the blockade because it meant that blockading ships didn't have to go the whole way uh, back north to get supplies. They used Beaufort as a coaling station. Um, and in return, the, this made blockade running a very, very lucrative business involving many North Carolinians as well as the state government. Um, Wilmington became the center of what became known as the lifeline of the Confederacy, and it was all because of the blockade. Um, Union naval strategy hinged almost completely on the blockade, um, as, as we can see from what Wells is, is, is putting forward here. Um, you know, so everything that the Union Navy does is kind of contingent from this point forward on, on the blockade. And it goes the same for the Confederacy. Confederate naval strategy, while it considered the blockade was a more, was a more defensive strategy, um, the, the Confederate strategy overall was not an offensive strategy, as you can tell here, protect and defend. Okay. That, that was the, the primary job of the Confederate Navy, protect and defend the southern rivers and harbors. And if they could reverse some of those early losses, particularly New Bern, Beaufort, things like that, that was great. But they wanted to protect and defend the inland waterways. They wanted to break the blockade, defy the blockade. And they did that in some instances. Um, and then destroying enemy commerce, that, that takes us back to the Alabama, Shenandoah, ships like that, which have nothing to do with the blockade. But Mallory... Confederate Secretary of the Navy, Stephen Mallory, really sees river and harbor defense as the Navy's foremost duty. That, that's really what he was all about. Um, he wanted to challenge the blockade by various means, um, but his efforts to do so were not nearly as successful as, as he had hoped at the outset of the war. And the truth is, Confederate officials never really cared a whole lot about the blockade, other than how it impacted foreign affairs, okay? Um, the, the Confederate government felt that the blockade was nothing more than a paper blockade, um, 
they felt that it should be completely ignored by other nations. They, they just didn't really pay it a whole lot of mind, as well as not paying a whole lot of mind to the Confederate Navy in general. Um, the, the, you know, Southern uh, military strategy didn't take the Navy into account a whole lot at all. So the Navy was kind of left to its own devices in, in a lot of ways, never had the material supplies, manpower that they needed, and that affected their ability to do their job in, in defense of the southern waterways. So the USS Daylight is the first to arrive off the coast of North Carolina, takes up station at the mouth of the Cape Fear, July 20th, 1861. And within a year of that date, Rear Admiral S.P. Lee had three cordons of blockaders guarding the most difficult areas. Um, it was nearly impossible to keep vessels from entering or leaving due to the difficult geography of the Cape Fear region. We'll talk about that too. Cape Fear River had two inlets, old inlet and new inlet. And uh, even though they were only six miles apart as the crow flies, it was hard to blockade because they were separated by frying pan shoals, which extended 25 miles out into the Atlantic Ocean. And this meant that the blockading fleet effectively had to cover about 50 miles worth of territory in order to guard the Cape Fear. It makes it extremely difficult to close anything off, especially when you don't have enough ships to do it. You can see here Wilmington is situated uh, 570 miles from Nassau in the Bahamas and 675 miles from Bermuda. It was an easy run from either of those places straight into Wilmington. Um, and, and Wilmington itself, situated almost 30 miles up the Cape Fear River from the mouth, was easily defensible from any kind of direct attack. And so Wilmington, very, very early in the war, becomes extremely important, particularly in North Carolina, and as the war drags on, even more so uh, down the line. Now. The situation frustrated Union blockaders. Uh, I mean, you can read any number of accounts from, from Union sailors and officers on the blockade. It was an extremely frustrating prospect for them. Um, one of S.P. Lee's staff said, none can be more vigilant than we are, but that vigilance rarely paid off. Um, if blockaders did give chase, they had to be careful not to venture into the range of the guns of Fort Fisher and the other Cape Fear defensive works. Um, and by the war's end, the success rate of blockade runners at the Cape Fear was over 80%. Uh, so, you know, blockade running at, at, at the Cape Fear was extremely lucrative. On the flip side of that, and you can see here a, a great quote by W.F. Keeler, the, the paymaster on the USS Florida, our effective blockade is a perfect farce. Um, and the Confederates knew that. I mean, it, it wasn't a secret. Blockade duty was perfect boredom for most of the sailors in the fleet. The high hopes of prize money very rarely panned out, particularly early in the war, but in the rare instances that they did, it gave hope to all the sailors on station. Um, captures of enemy vessels by the Union Navy generated $23 million over the course of the war. Half of that went to the U.S. Naval Pension Fund, and the rest was split among the crew members whose vessels had secured the capture. Um, but captures were very, very rare. And if you were a Union sailor lucky enough to be on a vessel that captured a blockade or, or blockade runner, you were very, very lucky. Unsuccessful attempts were taken very personally by the Union sailors, and it led to low morale amongst the Union fleet. Uh, one sailor lamented, if disappointments make philosophers, we ought to rank with Diogenes. Now, that's a pretty obscure reference for a Union sailor. I kind of wonder where that guy was from, but hey. But the, the fact that the blockade was less than effective led the Confederate government to hold out hope for foreign recognition and or intervention by European nations on behalf of the South. And it wasn't a secret that running the blockade um, that Great Britain was a major source of supplies for the Confederacy. And it, at the same time, they were willing to sell military goods to the government in Washington as well. Um, so just a little bit about the blockade running business. Cotton that sold for three cents a pound in the Confederacy was selling for anywhere from 45 cents to a dollar per pound in England. It's no secret why investors would take on the risk of becoming engaged in the blockade running trade. It was extremely lucrative. Successful blockade runners piled up millions of dollars in profits. The blockade runner R.E. Lee ran the blockade 21 times in 
and could carry a load of cotton worth about $2 million each trip. Um, so you can see here, a steamer capable of carrying 1,000 bales of cotton could make $250,000 profit in a single trip. Um, two successful trips would cover all the investor costs for a blockade runner. The Banshee, amaz amazing, made 700% profit for her investors. It's no, no wonder that getting involved in blockade running was very lucrative. And you can see, even for the crew, how much money they could make doing this. The profitability of blockade runners was arguably stifled by Confederate restrictions on the trade. Um, the Richmond government required all blockade runners involved in the trade to carry one half of their cargoes on Confederate account. Um, bringing that back to North Carolina, that severely irritated Governor Vance. Um, he felt that the Confederate government was hampering efforts of the states to supply their soldiers and citizens with required necessities. And it led to uh, one of my favorite Vance quotes. He said that Wilmington was more effectually blockaded from within than from without, meaning that the Confederate government was doing more to stifle trade than the Union blockading fleet ever was. Um, so while we're talking about the state being involved in blockade running, here it is, our most famous state-owned blockade runner, the Advance. The state of North Carolina entered the blockade running business at the suggestion of Adjutant General James G. Martin. Uh, Governor Vance authorized the purchase of the steamer, which was named Lord Clyde, which was then converted to the blockade runner Advance. Uh, state purchasing agent John White secured the English firm of Alexander Colley and Company as agents for the state of North Carolina, and that was the firm that handled the state's blockade running affairs throughout the war. Um, you see the, the, the record of the advance here between spring of 1863 and late summer of 64. She made at least eight trips through the blockade. The state sold half their ownership in December of 1863 and used the money to purchase a number of other blockade running ships. And the advance was eventually captured September 10th of 1864 on a run out of Wilmington. But that leads us back to a discussion of numbers. The average steamer broke the blockade four times before being captured or destroyed. But remember, it only took two trips to make it profitable, so they, they had already made their profit at that point. Uh, success rates at Wilmington and Charleston were over 80%. I think the success rate at the Cape Fear by the end of the war was somewhere around 85%. Um, four ships named there combined 52 trips through the blockade on those four ships. And the most successful, the Siren, made 33 trips all on its own. You can see why ships like the Banshee were making 700% profit for their owners when they can make that many successful trips through the blockade. The success of blockade running uh, drastically changed Wilmington. Um, and here you kind of see, if you, if you break up the blockade into chunks, you can kind of get a view of what was happening. November of 63 to October of 64, and October 64 is important because that's when David Dixon Porter takes over uh, the, the North Atlantic blockading squadron, and that changes everything. But 6.2 million pounds of meat, 1.5 million pounds of lead, 1.85 million pounds of potassium nitrate, and why is that important, Chris Meekins? <laughs> you, you took my artillery class. You know why potassium nitrate is important. It is the key ingredient in making black powder, yes. Um, and all, all these supplies that came through just in that 11 months. Um, but Wilmington as a town changed tremendously during this time. The town swelled with people who were employed in the blockade running trade, military personnel, and all other types of folks. Speculators from all over the South joined many foreigners in Wilmington who were engaged in the blockade running trade. Uh, one man said, at every turn you met up with young Englishmen dressed like grooms and jockeys or with a particular coachman-like look. These youngsters had money, made money, lived like fighting cocks, and astonished the natives by their pranks. These youngsters kept open house and spent their paws and the company's money while it lasted. They fought cocks on Sunday until the neighbors threatened prosecution. 
A stranger passing the house at night and seeing it illuminated with every gas jet lit and hearing the sound of music would ask if a ball was going on. Oh no, it was these young Englishmen enjoying the luxury of a band of Negro minstrels after dinner. They entertained any and everybody from Beauregard and Whiting down to the most insufferable sponge or snob who forced his society upon them. This is a huge change for sleepy little Wilmington. Even though Wilmington was the largest town in North Carolina at the time, they weren't used to this kind of bustling activity. The crime rate in Wilmington went up tremendously. All kinds of, of things were happening. And of course, one of the things the blockade runners bring in with them is the dreaded yellow fever epidemic uh, that killed so many people in Wilmington. And um, my friend Jim McKee down at Brunswick Town, Fort Anderson, has been doing a lot of research lately and sent me a few newspaper clippings he's found uh, relating uh, August of 1864 to the horrors of the yellow fever epidemic. Uh, the first one from the Raleigh Daily Progress. Uh, some of the papers have noticed the appearance of yellow fever in Wilmington. This is not uh, this is not so. There is no fever in Wilmington, and we trust there will be none this period. There are probably some cases at quarantine, 30 miles below the town, but there is thought to be but little danger of communi communicating it with the town. Uh, the fever is from Nassau, and one of the luxuries of the blockade. Um, so there they're talking about Fort Anderson and the quarantine station. And from the Edgefield Advertiser in South Carolina, a gentleman just from Wilmington informs the Augusta Chronicle that all the blockaders are now stopping about 30 miles below the city at Fort Anderson. Uh, some 13 are now congregated there. All of them have one or more cases of yellow fever on board. Stevedores have been sent down and the vessels are unloading their cargoes and reloading at that place. So after the epidemic, they take measures to stem that kind of activity from, from Wilmington and they establish the quarantine station at Fort Anderson. So the entire Cape Fear region is very much involved in, in blockade running. Now from mid-1863 to the end of the war, all these stations are cut off by mid-1863. By the middle of 1863, the only blockade running ports left open are Mobile, Charleston, and Wilmington. Um, but Charleston was so effectually blockaded that it was very, very difficult to try to run into Charleston, that probably much more effectually than Wilmington. That all changes around mid-1864 with Admiral David Farragut when he closes Mobile. Um, in fact, we just literally a week ago passed the 150th anniversary of the closure of, of Mobile. Um, so Farragut closes the port of Mobile, and Wilmington is really the only southern port left open to blockade running at that point. So from August of 64 up to the end of the war, Wilmington is all that's left, which only serves to highlight their, their role as the lifeline of the Confederacy. October of, of 1864, things start to change, as I say, because David Dixon Porter takes command of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron, and the Union command starts to look very, very seriously at shutting down, uh, capturing Fort Fisher and shutting down Wilmington. Porter's very, very good at blockading duty. Porter had an interesting quote that blockading the Cape Fear was very much like a parcel of cats watching a big rat hole, the rat often running in when they are expecting him to run out and vice versa. And that literally is how it was until Porter came on duty. Between mid-October 1864 and early December, Porter's fleet captured and destroyed five and a half million dollars worth of property at the Cape Fear in blockade runners. Porter himself earned $275,000 in prize money in seven weeks. Uh, as he said, his bank account was becoming much larger than naval officers should be. This also led to questions of whether he was really serious about shutting down Fort Fisher and Wilmington because all of a sudden Porter was making money hand over fist by capturing blockade runners. But of course the first attempt at Christmas of 1864 is unsuccessful. Uh, much of that gets blamed on the Army. Um, even though the Navy had their share of blame, they, they could have held on that. But 
Of course, January 13th, the Union Naval bombardment of Fort Fisher began, and January 15th, Fort Fisher had fallen. Over the next six weeks, the Union forces moved to Wilmington, and Wilmington falls in February. That effectively ends blockade running. Now, January 20th, only five days after Fort Fisher falls, John Newland Maffitt slipped into Old Inlet with the owl. Um, actually, he came in the day after Fort Fisher fell, the 16th. When he arrived at Smithville, now Southport, he learned of the fort's fall and he promptly went back to Bermuda. On January 20th, two ships, the Rattlesnake and the Chameleon, approached New Inlet and quickly realized that something was amiss because they didn't get signals back from Fort Fisher that they were expecting to get back. They reversed course as Maffitt had done and left. Shortly after the fall of Fort Fisher though, Admiral Porter began actively luring unsuspecting blockade runners in. He set up the signal station at Fort Fisher just as it had been by the Confederates and he was giving signals back to the blockade runners as they were coming in and he lured in a number of ships to capture after Fort Fisher fell. The Confederate owned ship, the Stag, was captured on January 20th along with a British ship, the Charlotte. But when Maffitt arrived back in Bermuda, he spread the word that Wilmington was now closed and starting in February of 1865, the blockade running trade pretty much evaporated. So the big question at the end is, was the blockade effective? Well, during the course of the war, over 6,300 attempts were made to run the blockade. Almost 5,400 succeeded. Doesn't seem very effective, does it? The Union Navy captured 1,149 ships, destroyed another 351. Blockade running supplied the Confederacy with countless essential items, food, clothing, medicine, paper, you name it. The South imported at least 400,000 rifles, which was over 60% of the Confederacy's arms, 3 million pounds of lead, 2 and a quarter million pounds of potassium nitrate, and something that uh, Chris and I were talking about just last week, when the blockade ended, when the blockade running ended, there were still massive stores of supplies in Nassau waiting for shipment to the Confederacy. 30,000 rifles, four 100-pounder Armstrong cannons, two and a half million pounds of bacon. That's just a few things. So the question of whether or not the blockade was effective, you can argue either way. At Wilmington, 2,054 attempts are made throughout the war. 1,735 are effective. North Carolina's efforts under Governor Vance brought in uniforms and material. You see all this here. 342,000 uniforms, 45,000 pairs of shoes, 36,000 blankets. Profit for the state between one and a half and two and a half million dollars, depending on who you believe. Vance goes two and a half million. Some others say eh, not quite so much. But Blockade running was a tremendous boon to the state of North Carolina during the war. There's no doubt about it. We had surplus supplies that we were selling to the Confederacy, selling to other states. So was the blockade effective or not? It becomes an argue of historiography. Um, Bill Still does a really good job of laying out the historiography of the blockade and blockade running in a brief book chapter he does in a book called Raiders and Blockaders, a book that he edited and wrote a number of chapters for. Um, the, the name of the chapter is the, the Union Naval Sieve, which might lead you to believe what he thinks about it. Um, historians such as James Soley, Charles P. Rowland, and Merton Coulter, and Byrne Anderson all would argue for the effective, the effectiveness of the blockade. Coulter says, without a doubt, the blockade was one of the outstanding causes of the strangulation and ultimate collapse of the Confederacy. Byrne Anderson says, without the relentless pressure of Union sea power, economic disintegration could not have been achieved. The blockade was the active instrument of sea power. You have those that will argue against it as well. Frank Osley disagreed and referred to the blockade as, quote, a leaky and ramshackle affair. Uh, Marcus Price, Richard Lester, and Frank Vandiver all agree. Vandiver said it must be apparent that the blockade was, from a Union point of view, far from a completely effective measure. And Bill Still, in his article, would agree with all of them and says that the Union Navy would have been far better served 
to focus more on combined operations rather than the blockade because the blockade was a sieve. Most historians will consider anything the Confederate Navy did a complete and abject failure, which is an easy call to make since the entire Confederacy collapsed. But blockade running might be the one shining beacon that salvages the reputation of the Confederate Navy. It's kind of an oversimplification to say that the blockade was either effective or ineffective. You can really look at it either way. Did the blockade contribute to Union naval victory? Well, yeah, it, it sure did in some small way. And I think the issue will continue to be debated. Um, in fact, North Carolina Historical Review published an article about it as recently as October 2011 on the effectiveness of the Union blockade. To me, that makes it pretty clear that the debate is far from over. Um, and it may never really be resolved. I think you can argue it either way. 